Hello everyone. My name is Liz Simpson, Education Advisor for CAFRI. And before I begin, I'm just going to share my screen with you. So it is a pleasure to join with you today um, to talk you through some of the career pathways to be found in our agri-food supply chain. And I say some because it would be impossible to mention them all. The variety is vast, which is what makes being part of it so exciting. And whilst it's true, there are job titles common across the industry, regardless of the sector. And I'm thinking production and innovation and transport. Equally, there are um, career pathways that are specific to a sector. And I'm thinking like um, distillers and craft brewers in the brewing sector. And I'm thinking geneticists that are working in the livestock and the pedigree industries. So let's jump right in. It's no secret that the Northern Ireland agri-food sector is at the heart of our local economy. Northern Ireland's agri-food industry has a seriously impressive story to tell. You know, from quite a modest land base of approximately about a million hectares. So geographically, we're not very big. We produce enough food to feed more than five times our population. So we could feed all of Scotland and Wales combined. Um, we are the largest manufacturing industry and 77% of what we produce is consumed beyond our borders. So we export to about 83, 84 countries around the world. And um, we contribute 5.4 billion pounds to the Northern Ireland economy and we employ about 100,000 people, making us the second largest employer in Northern Ireland. And that's a growth story. Back in 2016, we employed approximately about 110,000. So it's growing and expanding all the time. And it's very apt that the conference title is Food, a Fact of Life because it's very easy to take um, the food and drink that we love for granted, thinking that shelves are restocked as if by magic. But it's not magic, it's people. It's creative, innovative, uh, motivated, forward thinking people. Some are science based, some are business based, some creative and quite artistic, all working together to maintain our industry. You know, we have some of the world's finest brewers and bakers and butchers and growers and farmers and processors. They're all here and they call Northern Ireland home. Generations of traditions being passed down through the families. So they're not going anywhere and the industry will continue to thrive as a result. And I note that previous speakers talked about the arable um, farming sector and they talked about the red meat sector. So for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to hang my examples on the dairy sector, not just because milk production is one of Northern Ireland's biggest agricultural enterprises, but because we have so many graduates who are working in this sector and other sectors, of course. But, um, do you know, Northern Ireland has a very important natural resource which our arable sector, our red meat sector, our dairy sector all draw on. And that is that we have plenty of rain. So it's the perfect climate to grow abundant crops, a lush grass for our, our livestock to graze on and our dairy cows to produce high quality milk and meat products. And from that, we produce the finest range of high quality products, hopefully in a way that minimises our impact on the environment. And herd health and well-being is of the utmost importance for every dairy farmer, with on-farm milk quality having a massive impact on final product quality. And that makes sense. You need really good quality at the start to ensure really good quality products at the end, especially when we're talking about products like baby formula, and cheese and yogurts. So the career pathways span a variety of different um, uh, jobs and the dairy industry alone employs about 2,300 people. So there's quite a lot of people employed in it doing a wide range of jobs and for the purposes of today's presentation I've just chosen a couple. So we will have design engineers who are involved in designing our milk parlours, our bulk tanks and our factories using robotics and technologies to make sure they're designed as efficiently and as effectively as possible. 
We will have farm inspectors who are employed to make sure that there is compliance on the farm, to check animal welfare, to, share, to check herd records and traceability, to make sure that the farms are adhering to the certifications that they might have, for example, the red tractor logo or green certifications or the NIFCC certifications as well. We will employ animal feed nutritionists to make sure that the food that is be being made up for our livestock is nutritionally balanced and suited for its purpose. We will employ uh, geneticists to make sure that the, the bloodlines are there to make sure that we have the pedigree and make sure that we have got quality in our animals, which equals quality in our produce. And we employ lots of farm managers and farm supervisors and farm hands. And, you know, David Patterson is a really good example of one of our graduates who came to us after his GCSEs, a past pupil of Oma High School and stayed on to study on his degree. And he is now employed by Dale Farm as a dairy herd management advisor, working on behalf of Deal Farm, giving advice to Deal Farm suppliers to make sure that everything that's being done on farm is providing the quality that is going to have the Deal Farm logo on it at the end of the production process. So there's a lot of jobs in that sector. Moving then um, from the field to the fridge, and we look then towards sort of production processing. And the sector is well known for producing a wide variety of high quality, nutritious dairy products. So milk from our Northern Ireland dairy herds is widely recognised as being the best in the world, the best quality in the world. You know, we're a world leader in traceability and food security. We created the APHIS scheme, an electronic a cattle tagging database. We developed the world leading food fortress, which is a collaboration between businesses and academia committed to the highest standards of food safety and food security in our food chains. So whether the process is bottling or drying for milk powders or UHT or, or cheese production and whey production, you know, food safety and food spoilage reasons, we have to have um, really tight specifications for production and processing. And that should come as no surprise, really, given the vulnerability of some of our customers. Um, if you think about the fact that um, we're using our milk powder for, for baby formula. So the careers in the industry span testing and checking and compliance and making sure our products are nutritionally balanced and looking at the functionality of those foods. And if we're adding, if they're being fortified, making sure that they're being fortified from a nutritional angle. So we will employ food microbiologists to look at the, the food safety aspects of it and the food spoilage aspects and test for shelf life. And we will employ chemists to look at fat contents and, and sugar and salt contents. We will employ um, technical managers to look after the uh, specifications of the product and the compliance to make sure that it's being made accordingly. And I mentioned formulation and nutrition is there already. And then we'll have production managers like Maria Mullen here, for example, one of our graduates who's currently um, um, in Australia, actually employed as a production manager for Dale Farm. They gave her a sabbatical to head off and travel and, and uh, hold her job while, while she's away. Um, she's a past pupil of St Cairns in Ballygolly and she has got the responsibility of working in the Dale Farm plant and making sure pretty much that all the, the ingredients and all the people and all the machines and everything's in place for production to happen and for there to be a product at the end of the day. So compliance and checking is really very important and a did you know type fact that from the cow is milked until the, make, the milk reaches your fridge, that milk will be tested at least 10 times at different stages throughout the supply chain process. So that gives you an idea of how, you know, seriously we, we take the process and, and the focus is on it. And then stay in sort of in production, but um, looking more at uh, continual improvement and waste management. So our agri-food sector strives to produce the highest quality products and uh, process improvement is continual. So this is a method that businesses use across the sector to identify opportunities and areas to streamline work and to reduce their waste, because if you reduce your waste, you reduce your cost. So process improvement is continual with a constant focus on reducing waste, energy usage 
and uh, review and packaging content as well. And we saw a really good example of that in the news this week when we talk um, about pret manger who have announced that they're scrapping all their blended drinks, their smoothies and their milkshakes are going to be scrapped to UK customers. And the reason that they cited for that is because it takes too long to make up the orders. So there's creating a bottleneck in service. So instead, they're going to replace those blended drinks with ice drinks, which a have a shorter preparation time and b are cost less to make so that's where you see a focus on reducing waste and energy usage and a solution coming in place to fix it so the careers in uh, continual improvement typically will span lean manufacture where that word lean as you can see is basically where the business has tried to be as lean as possible stripping off any excess weight that they don't need removing your cost and your waste they will employ inventory managements, uh, inventory managers, sorry, who will look at your stock levels and make sure that you have just the right amount of stock in the right place at the right time, just in time, because if it's there too soon, then it's at an additional cost. If it's there too late, it's had an cost as well. We will employ people in engineering and in robotics where we are able to simulate a production line before you spend the money on integrating robots or cobots into your system. We work out what that's going to look like, first of all. And then we will employ people in food sustainability and policy. And that's a real growth area, as you can imagine, particularly in the last number of years where there's a real spotlight on sustainability, on environmental responsibilities, on social and employment responsibilities as well. And we have a lot of graduates that are involved in roles, for example, in the dairy sector, where they have responsibility for looking after the, 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 the work that goes into the anaerobic digester making sure that it's working to transform the company's waste into um, electricity, both on and off site, or um, incorporating the use of solar panels or recycling water or things like that, ultimately with the goal to reduce your costs, improve your quality and the safety of your product and increase your efficiency. And Gemma is a really good example of that. One of our food graduates, a past people from, I think, Our Ladies Grammar School in Newry, came to us to study in our degree um, after graduation was working with a company called Glambia in Armagh um, in a technical role then decided that she wanted to travel and see the world uh, took herself off to Australia with no intention of working really but when she was there got in conversation with somebody found out there was a vacancy with a company called Saputo Cheese in Sydney and decided to take up a bit of work just to get a bit of money to keep her traveling um, but that job in Sydney turned into um, a promotion to Melbourne and then a further promotion to California and now she's working um, as a technical services manager for Saputo Cheese in California. So there are local jobs as well as global jobs. Um, moving on then down the supply chain to talk about innovation and marketing and really um, you know, getting the right mix of products to meet the customer needs and wants um, is no surprise. So we will have graduates who are working in research and development. They will be working in new product development. They will be working in customer insights and marketing. And it's really with a view to be responsive to customer needs and customer wants and market changes. So successful companies will be those that are most responsive to changing consumer demands. For example, the demand for plant based diets or milk alternatives. And you can see some examples there. And Deal Farm are a company that's definitely on the ball with this one. You know, um, Caitlin Martin, um, one of our graduates who's a marketing manager for Deal Farm, is a really good example of the types of challenges that marketing and innovation and the NPD come, come up against, where Deal Farm own three brands. They've got the Deal Farm brand, they own Ramona, and they own Mullins Ice Cream. So if you want to go digital with your media then um, and your marketing, then you need to think about your different offerings. So you have got in this situation or in Caitlin's situation, varying product offerings, a varying customer audience and a brand budget, all working towards the objective of driving customer sales and grow market share. So the careers will span brand management and customer service and category development and social media and digital marketing. And when we talk about diversification, you know, that's in the news this week whenever um, Starbucks announced that they are going to produce a, an olive oil based coffee. Um, where they were having difficulty getting into the Italian market, they used the product of oil, they find an a surprising um, 
fact that it had a lovely velvety buttery flavour when combined with coffee and now they're very excited about this product that's suited to the Italian market. So that's diversification pretty much at its best and that's an example of what you know you'll find our graduates working on in different types of um, sectors. When we talk about our products, then we have to talk about packaging, you know, because very little um, food that we buy in the supermarkets is loose. A lot of it will be packaged in some shape or form. And advances in processing and packaging, they play a key role in keeping the Northern Ireland food supply among the safest in the world. And I talked to you about the food fortress earlier on. And you might be surprised to know how many global brands where their packaging is made here in Northern Ireland. So the quality street tubs that were on our supermarket shelves at Christmas, they're made in Dungannon. Um, the McDonald's Big Mac boxes and the cartons that the fries go into and the straws that they use, they're made in Belfast. Kellogg's, a global brand, the cereal boxes, they're made in Lisburn. And there's many, many more examples. So it's a multi-million pound industry because it's, Companies realise that the packaging is the last opportunity for a sale. They'll invest lots of money in production and processing and testing. But the packaging, if the customer likes it and if they're interested and motivated to lift it off the shelf, eight times out of ten, they'll put it into their basket. So companies know this. So Jessica is one of our graduates who works as an NPD coordinator in Hunaki, um, a well-known brand in Belfast, and she has worked with many high-profile um, customers, McDonald's being one of them, on the subject or the project like the, the paper straws, looking at innovation and looking at sustainability. So careers will span research and development. They will span packaging science and technology, particularly if you are incorporating maybe modified atmospheric packaging, if you're injecting inert gases into to the package to keep your product nice and brightly coloured or crispy or crunchy um, or if you're vacuum packing where you're sucking all the air out of it to reduce the risk of spoilage and extend shelf life. There's a lot of science involved in that and then we will employ people who have a responsibility for transport integrity because if you think about the function of packaging it's to protect the product inside, it's to preserve the product inside and extend its shelf life and it's to promote the product. So what we want our packaging to do is look at post-production, extended shelf life, allow the product to travel safely in some cases over long distances and still be wholesome at the time of consumption. So a growing industry, um, but a really, really important one nonetheless. And then imagine that we have made our product, we have got it packaged, we're happy for it to go to sale. That's whenever our logistics and our warehousing comes into play. So this sector plays a vital role um, with any food supply chain. Without it, raw material work in progress and finished product would not be available for sale. And that spans roads, rail, sea and air, which is sometimes forgotten about. We see our bulk tankers and our big Arctic lorries on the road, but we forget that a lot of our product comes in in containers via um, our shipping ports. And, you know, as well as all the other industries that you know, our transport and our logistics industry has come up against a lot of challenges in recent years and in recent months. They have the, the perfect storm of a shortage of HGV drivers, um, diesel price inflation, rising utility costs, all with a resultant impact on product price. So despite these challenges, our logistics industry and our transport and our warehousing, it has to deliver because food is perishable. So it cannot sit about for long periods of time. It has to get to its end user. So people, our graduates like Fanula here, who's a technical manager for dairy transport, will be employed to look after the food safety and the temperature control of the product during transit. And we'll employ lots of other people as well. We'll have our transport managers coordinating the transport, making sure the vehicles are there when they're needed. We will have logistics coordinators who are looking at big data, so where they're working in the ports. So when the, the, the ferries are coming in, the cargo ferries are coming in, stock, stacked with containers, they will have responsibility of making sure there is space in the port on land for those containers to be placed or the, the lorries then to take them away to their end point so that the ship can get back out to sea and reload. We will have um, compliance and training. So just like our, our 
process is subjected to testing. Our warehousing and our transport is as well. And our retailers in particular, our big multinational retailers, they will demand that the transport company that they we use will be B or C accredited, British Retail Consortium accredited. So these warehousing and uh, transport companies will employ trainers and compliance managers to be able to do just that and have that knowledge. And then we will have export advisors who are giving advice on export markets, on um, contract laws, on import export taxes, on seasonal information, forecast information, lots of stuff like that. So this is a really, really vital stage of the supply chain because all the effort and all the time and all the money that has gone into making the product and packaging the product, now we need to get it to the customer in pristine condition. So it's a, it's a vital role ensuring what we call the five rights of procurement, the right product in the right place, the right quality and the right time. Um, and then we have our Assuming that we have got it to our end product, we've got our sales and commercial management roles. So buying and selling a product needs to be managed at every stage of the agri-food supply chain, especially when you're dealing with retailers. Why? Because it has a massive impact on the price you receive, on the promotion of the product by the retailers and the, pos the position that your product gets in store and on the shelves. And fully stocked supermarket shelves is an expectation, but it is one that can be difficult to meet. You know, just this week, shoppers were told to adjust their expectations whenever shortages hit Pancake Tuesday. Why? Again, another perfect storm. You had an anticipated 40% spike in the demand for eggs, added to a sector that's already under pressure from avian flu or bird flu, combined with the grain shortage as a result of the war that's going on in Ukraine. And you will know that Ukraine is the country that's known as being the breadbasket to the world because of how reliant we are on grain supply. So many of our graduates in the food business management sector will be employed by manufacturers and wholesalers and retailers. And Paul here is a really good example, a senior supply chain manager for the Henderson Group, whose responsibility for making sure that all of the SPAR and the Eurospar and the NISA stores across Northern Ireland have got product on the shelf, despite all the challenges that we have just mentioned there now and many more on top of that. We have vegetable rationing that's making the headlines. Again, the challenge that we have because of extreme weather going on in Europe and in North Africa with floods and snow, we can't get our tomatoes and our peppers. So rationing by this, the retailers is in place until such time as the UK industry is ready to supply the markets. So there's a lot of plates spinning. It's, it's an important sector and it's a busy sector and it pays, it pays very, very well. So I'm moving through our different stages in the supply chain at pace. I'm coming towards the end of the presentation here now, but it's really just to, to finish off with the final point that I've referred a lot to CAFRI graduates throughout the presentation, specifically talking about um, our graduates who've come through Lockery campus who are specialising in food nutrition, food technology, food business management. And at Lockery campus, we have state of the art facilities to allow product pretty much to come from concept to to um, distribution stage, both industry and students use that. And that's brilliant because that means our students get real time examples and real time experience. And we're very proud of our links that we have um, with industry. So pupils can come to us after their GCSEs at level three. They can come to us after their A-levels for um, foundation and honours degree. And they can come to us as well for higher level and degree apprenticeship opportunities as well. So lots of uh, different study routes there for anybody that might be interested. And, you know, I've really had a, a lovely time sharing all this information with you. My contact details are there. If anybody would like to make contact with me at a later date with a view to maybe have me come into the school to talk to your pupils about the, what we've just covered here this afternoon. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. It is a whistle stop tour of the agri-food supply chain and the careers within. I would need a whole conference to myself to be able to cover them all in more detail, but I hope that's given you a little bit of flavour of what's on offer. Thank you to the British uh, Nutrition Foundation for the invitation to speak to you here today, and I wish you all a very good day. Thank you.